I've been asked to say a few words about Frank's approach to garden making and his role in promoting the art of the garden. In preparation for this, I reread um, his great book, The Garden, The Greater Perfection, and was, as before, impressed by his total immersion in the aesthetic considerations involved in the making of a garden. This past Thursday night, I ran the DVD, which was made, and many of you probably don't know this exists, um, which was made of the talk he had been giving around the country in conjunction with the publication of his book. Actually, I, wa I watched it twice. Uh, I smiled, I laughed, and to tell the truth, I shed a few tears. But they were not ch cheers of, of um, solemn tears, they were cheers of joy and of delight. I mean, to hear him, to hear his voice, to hear him wax poetic about plants, to be as droll and as funny and as, as clever as he could be was absolutely wonderful. Um, if you haven't already done so, treat yourself by dipping into these marvelous bits of exceptional garden, of, of an exceptional garden artist, or is it artist gardener? His adventures in creativity. They're both, it sounds like I'm doing a, a commercial, an infomercial. They're both available out in the lobby. Um, okay, Frank began and ended his, this lecture that has been recorded with quotes from others, and I would like to do the same. First, from Graham Stuart Thomas, famous English gardener and garden writer, uh, comes, and I quote, I have to do two things at one time now. I'm not sure if I can do this. Um, I look upon gardening of one of the fine arts as one of the fine arts and rightly understood not one of the least difficult. The painter or the sculptor makes his effects at once and obliterates or models and remodels until he has attained that at which he is aiming. But the gardener has to consider not just what his work is now, but what it will grow into in 10, 20, 50 years hence. He has to take into account not the present aspect of his materials, but what are the capabilities in the future and their relative powers of, of development. If he has a background ready to, made to hand, he is lucky. But he has to if he has to make it, he has to do with trees that are mostly far slower of growth than the more immediately effective plants which it is their office to set off. <clears throat> And then another quote, this one from an issue of the Royal Horticultural Society Journal of November 1997, titled, What is a Garden? Stephen Anderton wrote, and I quote, gardens will always be passionately desired and artistically conceived. They are the product of abundant imagination and abundant time. I would add, by the way, a great deal of hard work, dedication, repeated failures, and if at all possible, well, let's get ahead here. Frank's wonderful understanding of textures and the combination of textures. And mostly foliage, but those notes of the doll's eyes. Um, his beloved primulas. Well, where was I? I was saying I would, um, I would add a great deal of hard work, dedication, and repeated failures. And what you're looking at here, and most of you, many of you know what this is. It's down in Texas, in Austin, Texas, uh, <clears throat> John Ferry's garden, Pecka Wood, where I was walking through the garden there with John one day, and I said, you know, John, you know, what's all of that? And he said, oh, that's just some of the plants I've killed over the years, the labels. <laughs> And he had several clumps of those. Actually, there was a wonderful article in the Times a couple of weeks ago about his garden in which Ann Rava mentioned these. So yeah, you know, good gardeners kill plants. And um, they have hopefully copious amounts of well-rotted manure at hand, which Frank had. Frank's creativity was clearly driven by a passion for plants. Some might even call it plant greed. I say, hooray. <laughs> As it turns out, he clearly knew when the moment was right for restraint. 
He knew that less could be more and that there are occasions when space should be the primary concern. But clearly, he did love to wallow in a glorious tumble of botanically diverse and unusual plants. Thanks to his wife and Anne's suggestion and prompting, Frank opened up a whole new world of garden experience for us, for us all through the founding of the Garden Conservancy 23 years ago. Not only by visiting the Conservancy's official projects, such as the Bancroft Garden, the one that started it all, Hollister House and George Sholkoff's Garden in, in Connecticut, the Chase Garden, that's, whoops, that's still, the Chase Garden with Mount Rainier um, in Washington State, a wonderful garden, wonderful, absolutely iconic uh, 1950s garden, a, a piece in, a, a frozen in time. The Humes Garden out on Long Island. Rocky Hills, Henriette Serra's Garden uh, in Chappaqua. And finally, and there are many, many more, well, actually, this is Elizabeth Lawrence's garden in uh, South Carolina. And John Ferry's garden, Peckerwood, that I spoke of a few minutes ago. I, Antonia told me the other day when we did a run-through, she said, oh, that's a really old slide. She said, that house doesn't exist anymore. It's now a, a uh, quite different house. Well, I, I think it's 1990-something that that slide's from. But it's a wonderful garden. But not only can we learn by seeing the Garden Conservancy's official um, gardens, but through the immensely popular Open Days program, we now have the opportunity to explore the creative efforts of fellow gardeners throughout the country, thereby hopefully sharpening our own skills. Finally, I would like to quote again, but this time in Frank's own words. It is the person who makes a garden, who thinks of little else in his or her spare time, who sees the garden as it will be 15 years hence, and from whom it is an, an overwhelming preoccupation, and for whom it, it is an overwhelming preoccupation, who believes in the end, who believes in the end must derive the greatest enjoyment from it. Not only does the exercise of painting the picture absorb all of your interest and attention, but then you find unexpected rewards in the continuous changes within, all of which add unexpected depth and dimension to what has been created. Emotions and sensuality are what a garden is all about. We should be transported from our regular preoccupations. With an open heart and soul, we can re be receptive of the images, scents, sounds, spaces, and views that surround us, as well as to the touch of the wind and the rain to the peace everlasting of the genius of the place. Ideally, all the nobler emotions should be exercised so that we sense fulfillment and satisfaction and inner peace when we have finished, a sense of communion with those who are no longer with us and those whom we love. Thank you.